Well, let me invite you to get your Bibles out again and turn with me to the New Testament book of Ephesians. And while you're turning to the New Testament book of Ephesians, let me ask you a question. Do you have any idea how rich you really are? That is really, in essence, part of the theme throughout the book of Ephesians. You know, the saints of God at Ephesus, I shared with you uh, last time and maybe time before, they come out of some horrific situations. They lived in uh, godless situations. They, Ephesus was a, a city that was, it was a mega city. I mean, probably 200, 250, 300,000. And there were so many things that were going on in Ephesus, just like there are in, in any major city. Uh, but Ephesus was, uh, one of the claims to fame for Ephesus was the uh, temple to Diana, or the temple of Artemis. And in that temple, there was a lot of uh, uh, activity, and it was a temple that uh, had temple prostitutes, and, and it really was a city that was uh, bathed in ungodliness. And yet it was in the middle of that city that God would birth, as I mentioned last time, one of the most powerful New Testament churches, and he would literally resurrect those who were dead in trespasses and sin because that's exactly what Paul is talking about in Ephesians 1 and in Ephesians 2. As a matter of fact, if you don't understand who you are as a Christian, you cannot live it out. And so Paul is making it clear in chapter 1. He said, I want to remind you that God has blessed you. He said, I want to remind you that God has forgiven you. Listen, it doesn't matter what you've done. It doesn't matter how bad you've done it. You have been forgiven by the grace of God. I like what I heard one fellow say. Someone was saying, what do I need to do for my salvation? He said, it's too late. And literally scared this man to death. He said, what do you mean it's too late? Are you saying it's too late for me to be saved? He said, it's too late for you to do anything. And really made that fellow a little scared. And he said, it's already been done. It was done 2,000 years ago, and that's exactly what Paul is reminding the saints of God of. He said, I want to remind you, you're forgiven, you're accepted, you're adopted. As a matter of fact, do you know before the foundation of the world, God knew how you was going to respond to the gospel? And that's exactly what God is reminding the saints at Ephesus about. But when you come to Ephesians chapter 2, Paul is continuing. He's talking about God's riches to sinful man. Now, you remember last time that we looked at verses 4 and 5, and we're going to really look at 4, 5, and 6 again tonight because there's so much in them that you need to listen carefully to what they say. I want you to listen, and I want you to put your name in some of the places where he's referring to the saints of God because that's exactly what God did to you and me. Let's listen to Ephesians 2, 4 through 10. I'm going to read it out of both uh, translations so you can listen to both of them. But God, who is rich in mercy, for his great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ. By grace you're saved. He hath raised us up together and has made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. Not of works, lest any man should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. Now listen to the Living Bible. But God is so rich in mercy, he loved us so much that even though we were spiritually dead and doomed by our sins, He gave us back our lives again when He raised Christ from the dead. Only by His undeserved favor have we ever been saved and lifted us up from the grave into the glory along with Christ where we sit with Him in the heavenly realms all because of what Christ Jesus did. And now God can always point to us as examples of how very, very rich his kindness is, as shown in all that he has done for us through Jesus Christ. Because of his kindness, you have been saved 
through trusting Christ. And even trusting is not of yourselves. It too is a gift from God. Salvation is not a reward for the good we have done. So none of us can take any credit for it. It is God himself who has made us what we are and given us new lives from Christ Jesus. And long ages ago, he planned that we should spend these lives in helping others. Now, when you listen to the Apostle Paul, if there is one thing that Paul wants to resonate and get into the hearts of the minds of the men and the women who are in Ephesus, it's to remind them what God has done to them. Now let me just point a little bit for just a moment and go, let's go back a little bit to the cross. In your, in your outline, I want you to just follow along before I get to the first point. Because oftentimes there's a, a tremendous misunderstanding about Christianity and about salvation. And the truth about it is a lot of times it's even inside the church. You know, Paul is reminding the saints of God that everything lives and dies on the resurrection. The resurrection of Christ is not just some noble lesson to teach man that he can rise above his circumstances. It's not some psychological lesson. It's not just some emotional lesson. But the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ is literally the single most determinant event of all of history. And here's why. It is the event where every man, every woman who has lived, is living, or will ever live, their eternal destiny will be based on what they do with the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And so that's exactly what Paul is reminding the saints of God. And uh, it is that gospel that God brought to to Ephesus, probably through uh, Aquila and Priscilla. Uh, They were especially gifted couple. And they were left in Ephesus by Paul to bear the message of God. And remember, you know, whenever you declare the gospel, you don't have to try to get people to believe the gospel. Listen, the gospel is the power of God unto salvation. You and I don't have to manipulate people to believe. We say, now, now they didn't believe this time. Now, we need to color it up. And No, you don't do anything because the, a dead man can't do anything to help himself. And so, uh, as you recall, Ephesus was a tremendous place of sin, of sensuality, of sex. Uh, There was nothing uncommon for men and women to do all sorts of sexual acts one with another. But that is exactly where God put Paul and God put the New Testament church. As a matter of fact, you uh, look at uh, Paul and you can go back to Acts chapter 19. And Paul stayed a period of time preaching. And teaching in uh, in Ephesus, and uh, you know there was false teachers all the way back then. And by the way, there's going to be false teachers until the day the Lord comes. When you see a church that is growing, you say, "Man, what are they doing?" Always be careful, because weeds always grow faster than trees do. I don't know if you'd ever noticed the world of God very carefully, but it takes trees a long time to grow. But weeds they sprout up very fast. And so in the world, all the way back to the first century, there were false teachers, there were false men in the church. And so Paul was making it very clear. And that's why he did everything he could to refute. And that's why I want you to hear, and and as we go through Ephesians, I want you to hear what the gospel is and what it is not. The gospel is not a self-help program. It is not just trying to do better or turning over a new leaf. Paul knew better, and, and it's the power of God to salvation. As a matter of fact, you know, uh, there have been a lot of folks uh, that have devoted themselves in the early church to endless genealogies, according to 1 Timothy. And so it's against that backdrop of sensuality, false teaching, all sorts of ungodliness that God plants His church. Now watch this. You know, sometimes we say today, say, man, it's a, it's a horrible day for the church. No, it's not. It's never a horrible day for the church. Why do you think, listen, God puts His light in the midst of a wicked world. Christians may get persecuted. We may get killed. But isn't that the least we can do for our glorious God who saved us and redeemed us? Uh, I like what I heard uh, Dr. John MacArthur say in his book, Slave. He shares the following. One of the dominant features of the universal human fallenness is the sinner's deception about its true condition. Motivated by pride, the depraved mind thinks itself better than it really is. 
and as slaves to sin, all believers are hostile toward God and unable to please Him. And you see, the reality of it is the world that we live in is walking dead men and women. That's exactly what God says. You know, your friends don't need help if they're lost. They need resurrection. And you and I need to go back to the fundamental reality, what is salvation? And so uh, you remember in chapter 1, God reveals His blessing, His peace, His forgiveness. God also makes it clear that salvation is His act. Listen, you don't do anything to be saved. You know why? Dead men can't resurrect themselves. A blind man cannot make himself see. And so that's exactly what Paul is saying. And, uh, and by the way, you know, sometimes we say, you know, this, this world, why do people do this? Well, think about it for a moment. You know, why do people believe God doesn't exist? Can I tell you the reality about a dead person? I've stood over a lot of dead people in my life. I've stood over the bodies of little dead children. I've stood over the bodies of, of babies that have died. And no matter how much that mother cries and no matter how much that uh, mother may want to take that baby in her hand, no matter how much, you know, that child means, no child that is dead responds to stimuli. My mother was my mother for many years until the Lord called her home in 1996. And I went to her bed and no matter what I said or did, mom was dead. And the reality of it is that a person who is dead cannot respond to stimuli. A person who is dead, watch this, a person who is dead don't respond to God. As a matter of fact, we are dead to all divine stimuli unless God gives us life. As a matter of fact, you stop and think about it. Why don't people want God in their life? Because they're dead to divine stimuli. Why does the evolutionist believe God doesn't exist? Because he's dead to divine stimuli. And so, you know, why does a wicked world behave and do like they do? Because we're wicked, we're ungodly. That's what the Bible says. And so there's no person on the face of the earth that wants God. Now, listen very carefully. You say, now I've got some friends who, you know, under the right circumstances, they'd be Christians. No, there is nobody on the earth that wants to be a Christian. I want to say that so matter of fact that you don't miss it. There is nobody on the face of the earth that wants to be a Christian. And here's why. Every person is dead. You remember what God said through Ephesians? We were dead in trespasses and sin. And so let's, let's uh, look in, in our outline. Because here's the way God sees man. In the eyes of holy God. Now that's all that matters. The, is, are you the determining factor of the world? No. I'm not. God is. And God sees every man, woman, boy, and girl without Christ as walking dead people. So what do you expect out of dead people? You don't expect a whole lot of people to respond to God, relate to God, want God. And that's exactly what, uh, what Paul is saying. And so I want you to notice, and I want you to look especially in verses 4, 5, and 6 again. Especially... Verse 5 and 6. Even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ. Now, notice the riches of God. I want you to look in your outline. Look under number 1. First of all, God's riches are revealed while you're dead. Now, how many of you want to go out and invite the most godless person that's in Corbin or Williamsburg or London that is doing ungodly things? How many of you want to invite them into your home? Maybe while they're doing something heinous and ungodly even right now. Do you realize that God's riches are revealed when you're dead in trespasses and sin? You know, there's all sorts of things that people are doing right now that are godless. But do you realize that God loves them even right now while they're in the midst of sinning? Right while they're in the midst of it. Jesus even showed that in the New Testament. You remember the woman brought to him who had been caught in adultery in the very act? As I've said before, it's interesting the men know where to go. They, it's interesting they knew, why didn't they bring the man, by the way? You know, in the Levitical law that uh, they were to bring both the man and the woman and they were to be stoned to death. The man got loose. He might have been an influential person in the county, in the city, I don't know. But they brought the woman. And what did Jesus say? How dare you no good thing? No. He basically said this, you remember? Those of you that are without sin, cast the first stone. 
Now, are you saying, Pastor, that our Lord is advocating sin and advocating wickedness and advocating ungodliness? God forbid a million fold. But can I tell you what he is doing? And something that we as the church need to recapture as the people of God, we need to be reminded God's riches are revealed while we're dead to sin. All the cursing, all the profanity, all the foul language that is being used right now, do you think God knew about it from eternity past? Sure he did. And that's exactly what Paul said. The heart of holy God is to be rich to us, to be merciful to us, to be kind to us, even when we're, when we're lost. As a matter of fact, Paul knew this very well. He was on his way to persecute Christians. He was on his way uh, on the Damascus Road, and he was going to do whatever necessary. And the Lord struck him, and he said, Why do you persecute me? Notice this. Whenever you're persecuted, by the way, whenever you are persecuted, you remember this. Jesus takes it personal when you're persecuted. Jesus did not say to Paul, why are you persecuting my Christians? Did he? When they were being persecuted, Jesus said, why are you persecuting me? And so Paul knew very well. Here he was a sinner. Here he was wicked. Here he was ungodly. And that's exactly what Paul is reminding the saints of God. He said, God who is rich, even when we were dead in trespasses and sin. Listen, dead people can't do anything. I mean, dead are, are, are absolute... Does God expect people to speak wicked and talk wicked and live wicked? Sure He does. And Paul made it very clear. The very nature of God is to love us. And by the way, if that's God's nature to us, shouldn't that be fleshed out, as I've already mentioned last week? It ought to be fleshed out in your life. I'm not saying agree with people who are ungodly, but I'm saying love them. I'm not saying hate a person who is uh, completely different in their belief system than you. Do you love the atheist? Do you love the agnostic? Do you love the lesbian? Do you love the homosexual? Think about it for a moment. Right now, who is giving them their air and their oxygen to breathe? Who is doing it? Holy, almighty God, right? And so God's riches... And by the way, when you love somebody that you don't see eye to eye with, it's amazing what that does. I have a good friend. He's a nurse at Continue Care. And he always is kind to me and shows me, you know, just a very gentle spirit. And I was in a room one day, and this man was really talking about, you know, Catholics. He was talking about them and all sorts of things. And I just listened to him. I just kept listening. I didn't really say anything to him. I just listened. Then before I left, I asked him if we could have a prayer, and I had prayer, and I left. And as I walked out, he didn't say anything to me that time, but the next time I came in, he said, uh, Padre, that's what he calls me, Padre, come over here. He said, I was standing outside the room when that man was really belittling Catholics. And he said, here's what I noticed. You didn't say a word. Now, does that mean I believe and endorse what they believe in many things? No, because, you know, a child is not, an infant is not saved. You're saved at the point of accountability. And, uh, but here's the point. Every one of us need to be rich in mercy and kindness to others, right? Amen? If we're going to replicate, if you're going to be like Jesus, if you're going to walk and talk like Jesus... God who is rich in mercy while we're sinners. And so you have the life of Christ. So you ought to be rich in mercy and love and kindness. That's why Paul was so gracious. Do you realize Paul said to some of the church members at Corinth, he said, some of you were effeminate. In other words, some of you used to live a homosexual lifestyle, but you've been saved by the grace of God. You've been added to the fellowship at Corinth. He said, that's what some of you used to be. But he said, by the wonderful, marvelous grace of God. And folks, every one of us used to be dead in our trespasses and sin. Not a one of us wanted God. Every one of us were dead in trespasses. That's the truth of God's holy word. None of us were ever good enough where God said, you know what, I think he's a good one. I think I'll save him. That's absolutely inconsistent with Scripture. We're all walking dead people. So first of all, God's riches... 
is revealed while we're dead in sin. Second of all, God's riches make us alive with Christ. Now, let me just mention this. There's often a tremendous mistaken understanding of salvation. That's why some people just put little emphasis on it. I want to join the church and be baptized. Okay, boom, drop them. Listen, do you understand what biblical salvation is? Do you understand what God talks about when he talks about quickening? Well, let me sort of give you an understanding. When Jesus Christ died on the cross... He died, right? He was dead, he was buried, he was put in a tomb. They took his body, they did everything they could necessary, and then they took him to the tomb of Joseph of Arimathea. And on the third day, was resurrected by the hand of God. Now, what is all of that for? It's to show you what your sins and my sins are are required to have. They are required to be executed. But God said, I'm going to put my son in your place and I'm going to execute my son on your behalf and here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to resurrect you by the power of God. Folks, salvation is not some self-help thing that you do that you try to make amends and you just say, you know, I, I want to try to do better. I remember as a little boy, and I don't understand how it happens completely. I've been preaching and pastoring for years, but I still, I'm marveled by the salvation of God. When I was saved, listen, and here's why you need to always go back and check your salvation. Paul said, check your life and your doctrine. See if you're in the faith. There was a time I didn't want to read my Bible. But after I was saved, what happened? I was resurrected. That's what happens in every boy and girl and man and woman coming to faith in Christ. There is that resurrection power of God. And as a matter of fact, God makes us alive. You know, that's why, you know, whenever every young person I ask, and, and I'll, I'll ask, I'll say, do you feel a little funny on the inside? I know they don't know how to explain it and put words to it. I didn't know how to explain it, but I knew... Here's what I knew, and I can remember it in my mind's eye right now. I'm seeing it. I walked outside. The sky was bluer. The grass was greener. And here's why. Because I was resurrected. When you are saved, you're resurrected. Now listen. A resurrected person in Christ Jesus has a desire to walk with God. If you claim to be saved and don't want to walk with God, don't want to follow God, don't want to do what God says, that's a pretty good sign you've never been saved. And so Paul makes it very clear. He says, I want you to understand that he made us alive. What does it mean? Well, people believe evolution. People believe agnostically. People believe atheistically because they're dead. But the moment that you're resurrected, you become alive to God. What does that mean? You can fellowship with God. You can relate to God. You can talk to God. That's what I like to tell young people. I said, you can talk to the God of the universe. Really? You mean he hears me? Yes. Think about it. My little granddaughter called yesterday and Charlotte was in the doctor's office and Charlotte's phone rang and I thought it was Stephanie, but I got the phone. Shows you, I told Charlotte, I said, this is Southern hospitality. She was on the other end of the room and she couldn't get the phone to me. The nurse reached over to try to get it and even the doctor is going to hand me the phone. I mean, that's Southern hospitality. And uh, they was being kind about it. They, they, and uh, I got the phone, I answered it. And there was my little granddaughter's voice on the other end. Now, she don't know anything about technology. She don't know anything about iPhones or anything like that. She don't know about uh, the integrated circuit or anything like that. Here's what she knows. I call some numbers and Mama comes up. I call some numbers up and Papa comes up. And she also learns, too, that if I hold the phone down long enough, that's called photobombing. Sometimes there'll be 25, 30, 40 pictures of her. And all of a sudden, I thought, where'd those come from? But here, here's the point. She's just three years old, but she has the right to talk to Mama and Papa because she's ours. God gives us resurrection life. And that's exactly what Paul is talking about. He says, we were dead. Now listen, you don't don't help somebody get saved. I want you to listen to me very carefully. You know, and I've had people say things like this, and I want to use some phrases I've heard in my Christian journey and as a pastor. We need to get them saved. 
We need to help them get saved. We need to get them to join the church. You can't get a dead person to do anything. That's who you and I are, apart from the power of God. As a matter of fact, when God breathed upon you His resurrection life, you came to life. Why do you not want to go out and dance and carouse around and get drunk and stay out all night and party? Why do you not want to do what the world is? Why? Because you have the risen Christ living on the inside of you. And Paul said, we've been made alive. That's why those people in, in Ephesus, they were wondering, why don't I want to do those things? Why don't I want to go to a temple prostitute? Why don't I want to do those things? Paul, tell me. He said, God has made your life. You've got life on the inside of you. Now, we're dying, but there's a life on the inside of us. On the inside of a Christian, you may look 55, 65, 75, 85. But Paul said, I'm getting younger and younger. Really, Paul? That's exactly right. On the outside, we're wasting away. On the inside, being renewed. And so we're alive. We can, we can know God. That's why the world will say to you and me, said, what do you mean, know God? You see, and let me go back and use the illustration. If we had a coffin here and a person inside that coffin, they couldn't relate to you. They couldn't relate to the environment in this room. And people will look at you and me funny and they say, what do you mean about heaven? Because we've been made alive. We know about things the world cannot know. We know about angels. The world can't know about angels. You can't know about things until you come alive. We know about a real devil and what his, his fate is. We know about demons. We know about the protective hand of God. We know things the world cannot in, invariably know, no matter if you've got a Ph.D. or five of them from Harvard. And here's why. You and I have been made alive to God and that's exactly what he wants to reveal. He wants to reveal his life. And that's why Christians should have and enjoy a life beyond any other individual. Now, so we can love God, we can fellowship with God, we can hear God, we can serve God. And uh, there was an uh, inability to, to know God, to relate to God. Well, number three. God's riches lead to salvation from his wrath. Now, every once in a while, well, not every once in a while, all of us would talk about being saved. You hear people say and ask the question, are you saved? And uh, sometimes a person, what, what do you mean be saved? Especially maybe if a person doesn't go to church or is not oriented to church. But here's the reality, folks. Every person apart from God is going to experience the full fury of His divine wrath upon sin. Now here's something we, we can't comprehend. We live in a world of sin. We live in a world of wickedness. Sin has, cannot touch the holiness of God. That's why God has to destroy the world. I mean, He's going to have to deal with all wickedness. He's going to have to deal with all wicked man. Because God's holiness cannot be touched. Let me give you just an ex a couple of examples. Suppose I had the most beautiful styrofoam glass or cup that there was. But it's decorated ornately and I said, you know what? I've taken a long time to, you know, to uh, develop this or to, to make it, color it and all that. And I hold it next to a fire. What's that fire going to do to that cup? It's going to absolutely absorb it. It's going to absolutely consume that cup. Why? Because the nature of that cup will not withstand the nature of fire. The nature of sin, get this, the nature of sin will not be able to withstand the holiness of God. That's why God said the soul that sins must die. It cannot tolerate the holiness of God. Every sin, every sinner, every person apart from the salvation of God is going to experience the wrath of God. That's why Paul said, by grace are we saved. Saved from what, Paul? We're saved from the wrath of God that's going to come on all mankind that are without God's Son, Jesus Christ. We're not just saved from... A few bad things. All of us are sinners. 
but when we're saved, we're saved from the wrath of God. And that's what salvation is. You know, and so we're saved from the wrath of God. And, And a good picture, as I mentioned before, go back to the Old Testament and go back to Noah. There was one family that found favor in the sight of God, really one man. The Bible says Noah found grace in the sight of the Lord. Noah was a righteous man, and it was only Noah and his family. Now listen carefully. If you and I die, and if the Lord doesn't come for 50 more years, and if there is nobody but seven or eight people that are are saved on this earth, though there may be millions of churches... It doesn't matter how religious a church is or what type of programs they've got unless you are saved by the blood of Christ. There is no eternal life. Amen? And that's what God is saying through Paul. He says, I want you Ephesians who were living a sensual and ungodly lifestyle, I want you to know that God resurrected you and you're resurrected and you're saved from the wrath of God. We've seen a lot of things that have happened in our world recently. You see the fires in California. You see the flooding in Louisiana. You see so many things happening. And sometimes we try to put a handle on some of those things. And and I've tried to apply my mind to what I know biblically. Well, first of all, I remember Amos chapter 3, verse 7. There's no disaster that comes but what the Lord has permitted and allowed it. You say, now why would God allow flooding? And why would God allow... Catastrophe. Why would he allow all of that? Let's put it in perspective. We're going to live on this earth 50, 60, 70, 80, 90 years at the most, right? Don't you think he's a wonderful, kind, benevolent God that lets us know everything we've got can go up in flames? And the most important thing is my soul right with God. You see, it's a, a wise person who says, you know what? I may have lost everything, but I've not lost my, my relationship with God. And so, God's riches lead to salvation from His wrath. Now, let me tell you this. In this room, there's two types of people. Now, I want you to listen carefully. You are one that is saved from the wrath of God through Jesus Christ, and because of your faith in God through Jesus Christ, you're not going to experience the wrath of God. Or you're one who's dead in trespasses and sin, and someday on the schedule of God, you're going to experience the divine wrath of God, you're going to be banished for all of eternity, and you're going to live forever in a hell. Why? Not because you were not a moral person, but because you rejected the only payment for your sins, which is Jesus Christ. And so that's what Paul is saying to these saints. God's riches. Listen, no, no matter what you've done, let me say this. And by the way, sometimes I have people who come to me after they, they're saved and they say, Pastor, I've done this and I've done this and I've done this and I've done this. Does God still love me? Yes. Christ died for all your sin. You see, not one of them. God says, whoops, I overlooked that one. You weren't saved from part of your sins. You were saved from all of your sin. And the blood of Jesus Christ... I love this. The blood of Jesus Christ, His Son, cleanses us of all sin. I love that. Because sometimes, don't you ever find yourself doing something? Or, Lord, I shouldn't have done that. I shouldn't have thought that. I shouldn't have allowed that to happen. Would you forgive me? And sometimes we beat ourselves up. And here's what, Lord, I know that I've asked you so many times. In other words, we almost make ourselves more kind than God is. And that's idolatry. Don't you ever try to make yourself look better than God does. You can't even begin to fathom in a million lifetimes how merciful God wants to be. So, you know, God's riches lead us from His wrath. And then fourthly, God's riches provide us a place in the heavenlies. I love this one. I want you to look in verse 6. He's raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Now let me say this. We live in this human body. We've got a human brain. We're fallen. We're warped. And so there's a lot of things we can't understand. And really, the Christian life is a lot of paradoxes. What I mean by that is, it looks like the Christian life is a lot of contradictions. For example, if you're going to live, you must die. 
you know, you gain by losing. In other words, you don't seek first what to do for yourself. The Bible says seek first the kingdom of God and everything else will be provided. It's a paradox. We're on earth and there's the kingdom and we're, we don't, our king is in heaven. And so it looks like a lot of paradoxes. And, and, and yet here's what scripture says. We have two citizenships. And that's what Paul says. When you were saved, and that's why you cannot be saved and lost. That's why there is absolutely no biblical evidence to say, well, now I need to get re-saved. Folks, you can only get saved once. You know, Scripture makes it clear, that which is born of the flesh is flesh. How many times have you been born of the flesh? How many of you have been born of the flesh four or five times? How many of you, your mom's birthed you about three or four or five, six, seven times? You say she one time about killed her and she told me that as I was growing up. Well, born of the flesh, one time. Born of the spirit, one time. In other words, Paul's making it very clear. When we were saved, and here's the, here's the picture. The words raised and made are immediately. In other words, let me give you an example. God forbid that this happened, but it has happened. And if you ever hear of it happening, you remember this. Let's suppose a young person, a teenager, comes to faith in Christ. They come to faith in Christ on a Sunday morning. And everybody's excited and he keeps praying his prayer and means it with all of their heart. And they're so excited. I mean, they're getting ready to be baptized that, that Sunday night. And the church is going to get together and be around. All of a sudden that afternoon at 2.30, hit and killed. Where is he? Eternally. That's exactly what this verse is referring to. We are raised. We are alive. We're in the heavenlies. In other words, it happens instantaneously. You know, it took us, uh, what, six, seven years to get saved, didn't it? No. You're saved instantaneously. Now, I wasn't saved when I was baptized. I remember going through those baptismal waters and I did it with a little fear and intrepidation because my dad was the one who baptized me. And I always didn't mind my dad. Tried to. Well, I, I did my best. And my dad was baptizing me, and I guess if he wanted to hold me under, he could. But I can remember going into that water and him baptizing me and coming up. And I felt like a million dollars, and here's why. Because the Lord did something on the inside of me that I couldn't humanly understand at seven or eight years old, but still yet it happened. And so the Bible says we're, we're made alive. And the Bible says that we are raised. We're, and, and the word raised and made are immediately results of salvation. And someday you'll understand all that it implies. But here's what Paul says in the closing verses of verse 6. Has raised, past tense, us up together, made, past tense, us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. In other words, you're already seated in heaven. Now, no, you say, no, I'm not. I'm sitting right here in Faith Baptist. Well, I can't explain it all, but God has the ability to sit in every dimension. I'm already living, but the moment I breathe my last breath or the moment I take my last breath, the moment I die, whether it's I was going to say whether I'm young or whether I'm old, I'll be in the presence of the Lord. And Paul is saying to these saints who maybe look back at their life, and maybe you're one who you look back in your life and you think, oh, pastor, that's just for good people. No, there's no good person in the sight of God. We're all living dead men. And every single Christian who is a genuine Christian, we need resurrected. And if you're a genuine Christian, now let me say this, there's qualifiers over your life. Now you say, now I come to church Sunday morning, I come to church Sunday night, I come... Well, people are going to be in hell who are not Christians who go to church regularly. But here's the reality. The mark of your salvation is you want to relate to God. You want to walk with God. You know, I told you this last week, you know, we don't say, well now... You know, majority of people in Corbin, they're not going to church and they're not doing this. Now, I know some people say that, especially young Christians. But the reality of it is, is do you think it really mattered to Noah 
everybody else how they were living. He, he preached for 120 years. Man, you're talking about... You see, you can look at Noah as a tremendous failure, a tremendous success. Say, so he preached for 120 years and nobody got saved. I like to think about it as obedient. He preached for 120 years and did exactly what God told him to do. And he saved the rest of mankind. Because think about it. You're either from Shem, Ham, or Japheth. You say, what do you mean, Pastor? That's not my family. Well, that's Noah's kin. That's his... And uh, so, you know. But the reality of it is God's riches. He wants to be rich. We live in a world that completely distorts God. You know, will a sky fall on me if I do bad things? No. God will keep giving you air to your, to your lungs. He'll keep giving you energy to your body. Even right now, people who are speaking horrible things about God, he's giving them the air, the eyes to see, the, because of his goodness. Now think about it. For those of us that are redeemed, think what the rest is going to be. I mean, it's going to blow our, well, blow our socks off. That's an old phrase. That's just a, cliche, but I don't know if we'll wear socks in heaven. I don't uh, I don't know what we'll but when we get there, when we arrive we'll be absolutely amazed at the goodness of God, all because he wants to. And God says, I want to point to you. I want to show my angels. I want to sh- let them see how good and graceful and kind I am. So since that's the way God is to us, why don't we flesh that out to a lost and dying world? Why don't we flesh that out to people who maybe you don't know them, you've never seen them, and that you flesh out a love of a life of loving kindness? Let's pray.